Chapter 3 Desire The Starting Point of All Achievement The First Step Toward Riches When Edwin C. Barnes climbed down from the freight train in West Orange, New Jersey, he may have resembled a tramp, but his thoughts were those of a king. As he made his way from the railroad tracks to Thomas A. Edison's office, his mind was at work. He saw himself standing in Edison's presence. He heard himself asking Mr. Edison for an opportunity to carry out the one consuming obsession of his life, a burning desire to become the business associate of the great inventor. Barnes' desire was not a hope. It was not a wish. It was a pulsating desire which transcended everything else. It was definite. A few years later, Edwin C. Barnes again stood before Edison in the same office where he first met the inventor. This time, his desire had been translated into reality. He was in business with Edison. The dominating dream of his life had become a reality. Barnes succeeded because he chose a definite goal, placed all his energy, all his willpower, all his effort. He put everything he had into achieving that goal. Five years passed before the chance he had been seeking made its appearance. To everyone except himself, he appeared to be just another cog in the Edison business wheel. But in Edwin Barnes' own mind, he was the partner of Edison every minute from the very day that he first went to work there. It is a remarkable illustration of the power of a definite desire. Barnes won his goal because he wanted to be a business associate of Mr. Edison's more than he wanted anything else. He created a plan by which to attain that purpose, and he burned all bridges behind him. He stood by his desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life, and finally, a fact. When he went to West Orange, he did not say to himself, I will try to induce Edison to give me a job of some sort. He said, I will see Edison and put him on notice that I have come to go into business with him. He did not say, I will keep my eyes open for another opportunity in case I fail to get what I want in the Edison organization. He said, There is one thing in this world that I am determined to have, and that is a business association with Thomas A. Edison. I will burn all bridges behind me and stake my entire future on my ability to get what I want. He left himself no possible way of retreat. He had to win or perish. That is all there is to the barn story of success. Allow yourself no retreat. A long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation in which he had to make a decision that ensured his success on the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe whose men outnumbered his. He loaded his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy's country, and unloaded the soldiers and equipment. Then he gave the order to burn the ships that had carried them. Addressing his men before the first battle, he said, You see the boats going up in smoke. That means we cannot leave these shores alive unless we win. We now have no choice. We win or we perish. They won. Every person who wins in any undertaking must be willing to burn his ships and cut all sources of retreat. That is the only way you can be sure of maintaining the state of mind known as a burning desire to win. It is essential to success. The morning after the great Chicago fire, a group of merchants stood on State Street, looking at the smoking remains of what had been their stores. They went into a conference to decide if they would try to rebuild or if they would leave Chicago and start over in a more promising section of the country. They decided to leave, all except one. The merchant who decided to stay and rebuild pointed a finger at the remains of his store and said, Gentlemen, on that very spot I will build the world's greatest store, no matter how many times it may burn down. That was in 1871. The store was built. It still stands there today. The Marshall Fields Department Store is a towering monument to the power of that state of mind known as a burning desire. The easy thing would have been for Marshall Field to do exactly what his fellow merchants did. When the going was hard and the future looked dismal, they pulled up and went where the going seemed easier. Mark well this difference between Marshall Field and the other merchants. It is that difference which distinguishes those who succeed from those who fail. Every human being old enough to understand the value of money wishes for it. But wishing will not bring riches. 
desiring riches, with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence, a persistence which does not recognize failure. That's what will bring riches. Editor's Comments In other of his writings, Napoleon Hill uses the term definiteness of purpose as being interchangeable with desire. The following explanation is adapted from the Napoleon Hill Foundation's book, Believe and Achieve. Desire, or definiteness of purpose, is more than goal setting. In simplest terms, your desire is your roadmap to achieving an overall career objective. Your goals represent specific steps along the way. Having a desire, or definiteness of purpose, for your life has a synergistic effect on your ability to achieve your goals. As you become better at what you do, you devote all of your resources toward reaching your objective. You become more alert to opportunities, and you reach decisions more quickly. Every action you take ultimately boils down to the question, will this goal help me reach my desire, my overall objective, or won't it? Your purpose will become your life. It will permeate your mind, both conscious and subconscious. This is the end of the editor's comments. Six Ways to Turn Desire into Gold The method by which your desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite practical steps. 1. Fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. It is not sufficient merely to say, I want plenty of money. Be definite about the amount. There is a psychological reason for such definiteness explained in subsequent chapters. 2. Determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the money you desire. There is no such reality as something for nothing. 3. Establish a definite date when you intend to possess the money you desire. 4. Create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once, whether you are ready or not, to put this plan into action. 5. Now write it out. Write a clear, concise statement of the amount of money you intend to acquire. Name the time limit for its acquisition. State what you intend to give in return for the money and describe clearly the plan through which you intend to accumulate it. 6. Read your written statement aloud, twice daily. Read it once just before retiring at night and read it once after arising in the morning. As you read, see and feel and believe yourself already in possession of the money. It is important that you follow the instructions in these six steps. It is especially important that you observe and follow the instructions in the sixth step. You may complain that it is impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Here is where a burning desire will come to your aid. If you truly desire money so keenly that your desire is an obsession, you will have no difficulty in convincing yourself that you will acquire it. The object is to want money and to become so determined to have it that you convince yourself you will have it. If you have not been schooled in the workings of the human mind, these instructions may appear impractical. It may help you to know that the information they convey was given to me by Andrew Carnegie, who made himself into one of the most successful men in American history. Carnegie began as an ordinary laborer in the steel mills, but managed, despite his humble beginning, to make these principles yield him a fortune of considerably more than one hundred million dollars. Editor's Comment In today's terms, the value of Carnegie's fortune would be at least twenty billion dollars and probably a good deal more. End of Editor's Comment It may be of further help to know that the six steps were carefully scrutinized by the famed inventor and successful businessman, Thomas A. Edison. He gave his stamp of approval saying they are not only the steps essential for the accumulation of money, but also for the attainment of any goal. Editor's Comments In the time since Napoleon Hill wrote these words, advances in our understanding of both the physiology of the brain and the psychology of the mind have yielded a much greater understanding of human motivation. Even so, the methods used by modern motivational experts are essentially the same techniques advised by Hill. Research studies confirm that there is sound psychological basis for doing as Hill advises. Be very specific when setting goals. Perform the physical act of committing those goals to paper. 
and repeat your stated goal aloud to yourself often. These techniques have gained wide acceptance among modern experts in the field. The psychological principle at work is similar to that which underlies autosuggestion and self-hypnosis, concepts that will be discussed in greater depth in Chapter 5, Autosuggestion, and in Chapter 13, The Subconscious Mind. Hill's instruction to see yourself as you will be when you have already achieved your objective is also a specific technique. Today it is commonly taught by motivational experts under the term creative visualization. In Chapter 4 on Faith and in Chapter 5 on Autosuggestion, Hill elaborates on his method. Before moving on, the editors would like to reinforce Hill's advice to follow his instructions to the letter. The editors know there is a tendency for the reader to assume that it is enough for them just to intellectually understand a concept. As you read Hill's six points, you probably found yourself thinking, sure, some people might need to write things down, but I'm not a kid, I get the idea. Or, okay, I understand that saying it out loud might help some less sophisticated people, but I already understand the point intellectually. If you feel that way, let us remind you that many of the most successful people whom you admire did not think they were too smart or too sophisticated to follow Hill's instructions. The editors would again point out that if Napoleon Hill believed the actual acts of writing and speaking your goals is important, and if psychologists and motivational experts agree, then you would be foolish not to follow this simple advice. Just do it. This is the end of the editor's comments. The steps call for no hard labor. They call for no sacrifice. To apply them does not call for a great amount of education. But the six steps do call for enough imagination to see and to understand that the accumulation of money cannot be left to chance or luck. You may as well know right here that you can never have riches in great quantity unless you can work yourself into a white heat of desire for money and actually believe you will possess it. The Power of Great Dreams If you are in this race for riches, you should be encouraged by the following truth. The world in which we live is demanding new ideas, new ways of doing things, new leaders, new inventions, and new methods, styles, versions, and variations of everything all the time. Behind all this demand for new and better things, there is one quality that you must possess to win and that is definiteness of purpose, the knowledge of what you want and a burning desire to possess it. If you truly desire riches, remember that the real leaders of the world have always been people who harnessed and put into practical use the intangible, unseen forces of opportunity. Leaders are the people who convert those opportunities into cities, skyscrapers, factories, transportation, entertainment, and every form of convenience that makes things easier, faster, better, or just make life more pleasant. In planning to acquire your share of the riches, don't let anyone put you down for being a dreamer. To win the big stakes in this changing world, you must catch the spirit of the great pioneers, whose dreams have given to civilization all that it has of value. It is that spirit which serves as the lifeblood of our own country. Your opportunity and mine to develop and market our talents. A burning desire to be and to do is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. Dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. If the thing you wish to do is right and you believe in it, go ahead and do it. Never mind what they say if you meet with temporary defeat. They do not know that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. Marconi dreamed of a system for sending sound from one place to another without the use of wires. It may interest you to know that Marconi's friends had him taken into custody and examined in a psychiatric hospital when he announced he had discovered a principle by which he could send messages through the air. Evidence that he did not dream in vain may be found in every radio and television set, cellular phone, communication satellite, and every other wireless device in the world. Fortunately, the dreamers of today fare better. Today, your world is filled with an abundance of opportunity that the dreamers of the past never knew. If you doubt this is true, 
If you are feeling crushed because of a recent failure, you are about to learn how your failure can be your most valuable asset. Almost everyone who succeeds in life gets off to a bad start and passes through many heartbreaking struggles before they arrive. The turning point in the lives of those who succeed usually comes at the moment of some crisis through which they are introduced to their other selves. Editor's Comments Napoleon Hill's concept of the other self is mentioned elsewhere in Think and Grow Rich, but he does not comment on it extensively. The following elaboration is taken from his later writings. You've been thinking about your losses to the exclusion of everything else. The more you concentrate on them, the more you attract other losses. Stop thinking about them and make up your mind that you are going to benefit from your experience. Whatever personal obstacles you face, you must start getting to know that side of your personality that knows no obstacles, that recognizes no defeats. Cultivate a friendship with the other you, so no matter what you're doing, you are allied with someone who shares your goals. All the philosophy and advice about persuading others will be much more useful to you if you practice it yourself. This is the end of the editor's comment. Sidney Porter discovered the genius that slept within his brain only after he had met with great misfortune. He was found guilty of embezzlement and confined to a prison cell in Columbus, Ohio. And it was there that he became acquainted with his other self. He began to write short stories. Then, while locked in his cell, he began to sell those stories to magazines under the pen name O. Henry. Through the use of his imagination, he discovered himself to be a great author instead of a miserable criminal and outcast. By the time he was released from prison, O. Henry was the most popular short story writer in the country. Editor's Comments More recently, in another prison, another kind of writer met his other self, and country music gained one of its most talented songwriters and biggest stars. As a kid, Merle Haggard's family home was a converted boxcar in Bakersfield, California. After his father died when Merle was nine, more often than not, home for young Merle was a series of juvenile detention centers. At 16, he quit school, and for the next four years, the only mark Merle Haggard made in the world was a rap sheet for stolen cars, burglaries, and bogus checks. By the age of 20, he was serving time in San Quentin and gaining a reputation as a hard case con. Then he met his other self. Inspired by a concert Johnny Cash played for the inmates, plus conversations with men on death row and the time he spent in solitary confinement, Haggard learned that he had another self, and that self had something to say through his music. When he got out of solitary, Haggard asked for the hardest job the prison had to offer. He enrolled in night school courses at the prison, straightened himself out, and won his parole after two and a half years. He went back to Bakersfield and dug ditches during the day so he could polish his songwriting and performing at night. Within three years, he had a recording contract. Within five years, he had his first top ten hit, and has since gone on to become one of the most influential voices in modern country music. This is the end of the editor's comments. Thomas Edison dreamed of a lamp that could be operated by electricity, and he began where he stood to put his dream into action. He failed more than 10,000 times. Despite his failures, he stood by that dream until finally he was driven to the discovery of the genius that slept within his brain. Editor's Comments Dean Kamen got to know his other self very early in life. While he was a teenager, Kamen started his own company, building and selling control systems for automated sound and light shows. He was still in high school when he got the contract to automate the Times Square New Year's Eve ball. Though he went on to attend university, he never bothered to graduate because he was too busy working on something he called auto syringe, the first wearable infusion pump for administering drug therapies. His invention was hailed as a medical landmark, as were many of his other breakthroughs, which include a revolutionary kidney dialysis machine, an insulin pump for diabetics, an improved stent used for heart patients, and more than 150 other devices he has patented. One day, Seeing the difficulty a man in a wheelchair was having getting up a curb, Kamen set his mind to creating a device that would liberate people confined to wheelchairs. The result is the iBot, 
a revolutionary wheel device that uses computers and a system of stabilizing gyroscopes that imitate the working of the human body. It not only goes over curbs, but it will even go up and down stairs, travel over almost any kind of rough ground, and will allow the user to raise themselves eye to eye with a standing person. And it does it all without the user having to get out of the device or needing anyone's assistance. In 2001, Kamen hit the front pages when he introduced the Segway, a one-person people mover based on his iBot technology. It's a two-wheel scooter-like device that zips and zooms forward, backward, left, right, and comes to a stop without the rider doing anything more than barely shifting his or her body. It is so sensitive that it is almost as though it obeys the user's thoughts. The Segway may be a world-changing invention with possible applications for work and travel that stagger the imagination. As this is being written, the Segway is already being used to navigate large warehouses and is being tested by police departments and postal employees. While traffic cops and City Hall wrangle over whether the Segway belongs on the sidewalk or the road, Dean Kamen is dreaming a new dream. This time, the dream is an invention that may literally bring light to some of the darkest corners of the earth. Cayman has developed a non-polluting electric generator that can use almost anything as fuel. But here's the extraordinary part. He has created a revolutionary closed system so that the engine's heat is used to purify 10 gallons of drinkable water every hour. This amazing invention could bring safe drinking water to parts of the world where contaminated water kills millions. And at the same time, it will provide a source of cheap, reliable electric power. Dean Kamen is not some academic hidden in a lab somewhere. Kamen is an inventor. But like Thomas Edison, he is also an entrepreneur and businessman, creating and marketing devices that are changing the public perception of what an inventor is. This is the end of the editor's comments. Henry Ford, poor and uneducated, dreamed of a horseless carriage. He went to work with what tools he possessed without waiting for opportunity to favor him, and now evidence of his dream belts the entire earth. He put more wheels into operation than any man who ever lived because he was not afraid to back his dreams. Editor's Comments Stephen Jobs and Steve Wozniak, two university dropouts, dreamed of making and selling computers that the average person could use. Like Ford, working with the tools they possessed, they built the first Apple computer in the Jobs family garage. And like Ford, they weren't afraid to back their dreams. After showing their prototype to a local retailer, they got an order for 25 machines. Jobs sold his Volkswagen, and Waz sold his expensive Hewlett-Packard scientific calculator to raise $1,300 to start their new company. They took the money, convinced the local electronic suppliers to grant them a line of credit, and started production of the Apple I. They revolutionized the computer hardware and software industry. Released in 1976 and priced at $666, the Apple I earned them $774,000. Two years later, they introduced the Apple II, which in the next three years earned $140 million. In 1980, Apple went public, and after the first day of trading, the company had a market value of $1.2 billion. Wozniak left the company in 1981 but Jobs pushed through the development of the Macintosh in 1984. In 1985, Jobs left too, but in 1998 he came back to Apple to revitalize the floundering company with the creation of the iMac computers, the animation company Pixar, the iPod, and iTunes. In presenting stories of contemporary successes, the editors have followed Hill's style of using real people to illustrate the principles of success. But Napoleon Hill was granted a rare privilege. Unlike anyone before or after, he had the opportunity to personally meet the most powerful and successful people and learn firsthand the dreams that inspired them, the obstacles that confronted them, and how they found the courage within themselves to overcome their failures. Hill met many of the inventors and the empire builders who laid the foundations of 20th century American industry while they were still news, not history. Then, for more than 25 years, he studied the habits and learned the secrets of the next generations who built on the foundations, forged new industries, devised new systems, and dreamed new dreams. It was only because Hill was given such unprecedented access over such a long period 
that he was able to compare, contrast, analyze, and then formulate a philosophy of achievement based on the real stories of real people who had used these techniques to create their success. Think and Grow Rich revolutionized self-help writing and to this day is the standard against which all motivational literature is measured. Its success also helped create the market for the thousands of business biographies that tell in detail how the dreams were born, plans were made, frustrations were faced, and triumphs achieved in every sector of modern business. And because this wealth of information is now available with little more than the click of a mouse, you can read, hear, or watch today's greatest entrepreneurs and most successful CEOs confirming in their own words the basic truth behind every one of the principles Napoleon Hill explains in this book. The products or services they sell may be different, but the story of their success is the same. Dreams, followed by failures, followed by lessons learned, then success. For every Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, or O. Henry that Napoleon Hill cites to make a point, today there is a Steve Jobs, Dean Kamen, or Merle Haggard, proving that Hill's points are still valid. This is the end of the editor's comments. There is a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one is ready for a thing until they believe they can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief, not mere hope or wish. Open-mindedness is essential for belief. Closed minds do not inspire faith, courage, and belief. Remember, no more effort is required to aim high in life, to demand abundance and prosperity, than is required to accept misery and poverty. A great poet has correctly stated this universal truth through these lines. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening when I counted my scanty store. For life is a just employer. He gives you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, why, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire, only to learn dismayed that any wage I had asked of life, life would have willingly paid. Desire outwits Mother Nature. As a fitting climax to this chapter, I wish to introduce one of the most unusual persons I have ever known. I first saw him a few minutes after he was born. He came into the world without any physical sign of ears. When pressed for an opinion, the doctor concluded that the child might be deaf and mute for life. I challenged that doctor's opinion. I had the right to do so. I was the child's father. I, too, reached a decision. But I expressed my opinion silently in the secrecy of my own heart. In my own mind, I knew that my son would hear and speak. How? I was sure there must be a way, and I knew I would find it. I thought of the words of the immortal Emerson. The whole course of things goes to teach us faith. We need only obey. There is guidance for each of us, and by lowly listening, we shall hear the right word. The right word? Desire. More than anything else, I desired that my son should not be deaf and unable to speak. From that desire, I never receded, not for a second. What could I do about it? Somehow, I would find a way to transplant into that child's mind my own burning desire for ways and means of conveying sound to his brain without the aid of ears. As soon as the child was old enough to cooperate, I would fill his mind so completely with a burning desire to hear that nature would by methods of her own, translate it into physical reality. All this thinking took place in my own mind, but I spoke of it to no one. Every day I renewed the pledge I had made to myself that my son should not be deaf. As he grew older and began to take notice of things around him, we observed that he had a slight degree of hearing. When he reached the age when children usually begin talking, he made no attempt to speak, but we could tell by his actions that he could hear certain sounds slightly. That was all I needed to know. I was convinced that if he could hear, even slightly, he might develop still greater hearing capacity. Then something happened that gave me hope. It came from an entirely unexpected source. We bought a phonograph. When the child heard the music for the first time, he went into ecstasies. 
he promptly appropriated the machine. On one occasion, he played a record over and over for almost two hours, standing in front of the phonograph with his teeth clamped on the edge of the case. The significance of this did not become clear to us until years afterward. At the time, we had never heard of the principle of bone conduction of sound. Shortly after he appropriated the phonograph, I discovered that he could hear me quite clearly when I spoke with my lips touching his mastoid bone at the base of a skull. Having determined that he could hear the sound of my voice plainly, I began immediately to transfer to his mind the desire to hear and speak. When I discovered that my son enjoyed bedtime stories, I went to work creating stories designed to develop in him self-reliance, imagination, and a strong desire to hear. There was one storyline in particular that I emphasized over and over. Every time I told it, I gave it some new and dramatic coloring. These stories were designed to plant in his mind the thought that his affliction was not a liability, but an asset of great value. As a result of my studies and personal experience, I firmly believe that every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. However, despite my beliefs, I must confess that I did not have the slightest idea how this disability could ever become an asset. He won a new world with six cents. As I analyze the experience in retrospect, I can see now that my son's faith in me had much to do with the astounding results. He did not question anything I told him. I sold him on the idea that he had a distinct advantage over his older brother and that this advantage would reflect itself in many ways. For example, the teachers in school would observe that he had no ears, and because of this they would show him special attention and treat him with extraordinary kindness. And they always did. I also sold him on the idea that when he became old enough to sell newspapers, his older brother had already become a newspaper merchant, he would have a big advantage over his brother. My reasoning was that people would pay him extra money for his wares because they could see that he was a bright, industrious boy, despite the fact that he had no ears. When he was about seven, he showed the first evidence that my method of stimulating his mind was bearing fruit. For several months, he begged for the privilege of selling newspapers, but his mother would not give the project her consent. Finally, he took matters in his own hands. One afternoon, when he was left at home with the staff, he climbed through the kitchen window, shinnied to the ground, and set out on his own. He borrowed six cents in capital from the neighborhood shoemaker and invested it in papers, which he sold out. He took his earnings, reinvested in more newspapers, and kept repeating until late in the evening. After balancing his accounts and paying back the six cents he had borrowed from his banker, he had a net profit of 42 cents. When we got home that night, we found him in bed asleep with the money tightly clenched in his hand. His mother opened his hand, removed the coins, and cried. Of all things, to me it seemed she was crying over her son's first victory. My reaction was the reverse. I laughed, for I knew that my endeavor to plant in my son's mind an attitude of faith in himself had been successful. His mother saw in his first business venture a little deaf boy who had gone out in the streets and risked his life to earn money. I saw a brave, ambitious, self-reliant little businessman whose stock in himself had been increased a hundred percent. He had gone into business on his own initiative and had won. I was not only pleased, I was impressed. He had clearly demonstrated the first signs of a resourcefulness that would go with him all through life. The little deaf boy went through grade school, high school, and college without being able to hear his teachers, except when they shouted loudly at close range. He did not go to a school for the deaf, and we did not use sign language. We were determined that he should live like any other boy who could hear and speak. We stood by that decision, although it cost us many heated debates with school officials. While he was in high school, he tried an electronic hearing aid, but it was of no value to him. During his last week in college, something happened that marked the most important turning point of his life. Through what seemed to be mere chance, he came into possession of another electronic hearing device, which was sent to him on trial. He was slow about testing it, due to his disappointment with a similar device. Finally, he picked it up carelessly, placed it on his head, and hooked up the battery. Suddenly, as if by magic, his lifelong desire for normal hearing became a reality.
For the first time in his life, he heard practically as well as any person with normal hearing. Overjoyed because of the changed world that had been brought to him, he rushed to the telephone, called his mother, and heard her voice perfectly. The next day, for the first time in his life, he plainly heard the voices of his professors in class. For the first time in his life, he could converse freely with other people without them having to speak loudly. Truly, he had come into possession of a changed world. His desire was finally paying dividends. But the victory was not yet complete. He still had to find a definite and practical way to convert his disability into an equivalent asset. Thought that works miracles. Intoxicated with the joy of his newly discovered world of sound, he wrote a letter to the manufacturer of the hearing aid, enthusiastically describing his experience. Something in his letter prompted the company to invite him to New York. He was escorted through the factory, and while talking with the chief engineer, telling him about his changed world, a hunch, an idea, or an inspiration, call it what you wish, flashed into his mind. It was this impulse of thought that converted his disability into an asset, an asset destined to pay dividends in both money and happiness to thousands for all time to come. The sum and substance of that impulse was this. It occurred to him that he might be of help to the millions of people who go through life without the benefit of hearing devices if he could find a way to tell them the story of his changed world. For an entire month, he carried out intensive research during which he analyzed the entire marketing system of the manufacturer of the hearing device. Then he created a plan for reaching out to other hearing impaired people all over the world to share with them his newly discovered changed world. When this was done, he put in writing a two-year plan based upon his findings. When he presented the plan to the company, he was instantly given a position for the purpose of carrying out his ambition. Little did he dream when he went to work that he was destined to bring hope and practical relief to thousands of people who, without his help, would have been limited forever by deafness. There's no doubt in my mind that Blair would have been deaf and unable to speak all his life if his mother and I had not managed to shape his mind as we did. When I planted in his mind the desire to hear and talk and live as other people, there went with that impulse some strange influence that caused nature to become bridge builder and span the gulf of silence between his brain and the outer world. Truly, a burning desire has devious ways of transmuting itself into its physical equivalent. Blair desired normal hearing. Now he has it. He was born with a condition that in those days might easily have sent a person with a less defined desire to the street with a bundle of pencils and a tin cup. The little white lie I planted in his mind when he was a child by leading him to believe his impaired hearing would become a great asset, has justified itself. I am convinced it is a fact that there is nothing, right or wrong, that belief plus burning desire cannot make real. These qualities are free to everyone. Editor's Comments As Napoleon Hill was finishing this chapter on desire, it was reported that the famed opera singer Madame schumann Heinck had died. A passage in her obituary struck Hill as being so appropriate to the subject of this chapter that he was moved to comment as follows. End of editor's comment. One short paragraph in the newspaper story about the famed opera singer Madame schumann Heinck gives the clue to this unusual woman's stupendous success. I quote the paragraph because the clue it contains is none other than desire. Early in her career, Madame schumann Heinck visited the director of the Vienna Court Opera to have him test her voice but he did not test it. After taking one look at the awkward and poorly dressed girl, he exclaimed, none too gently, with such a face and with no personality at all, how can you ever expect to succeed in opera? My good child, give up the idea. Buy a sewing machine and go to work. You can never be a singer. Never is a long time. The director of the Vienna Court Opera may have known much about the technique of singing, but he knew little about the power of desire when it assumes the proportion of an obsession. If he had known more of that power, he would not have made the mistake of condemning genius without giving it an opportunity. Editor's Comments Although few readers of this edition will be familiar with Madame schumann Heinck, every reader knows a half dozen similar stories. It is true for every generation and every kind of music. 
At some time, even the biggest stars were failures. At some time, someone told them they weren't good enough. But every one of those times that they failed, their desire was bigger than their failure. That is why you know their stories. And it's also why you've never heard about the thousands of other performers who were also told they weren't good enough. The ones you've never heard of are the ones whose desire wasn't big enough. They are the ones who believed that failure was defeat. This is the end of the editor's comment. Several years ago, one of my business associates became ill. He became worse as time went on, and finally was taken to the hospital for an operation. The doctor warned me that there was little, if any, chance of my ever seeing him alive again. But that was the doctor's opinion. It was not the opinion of the patient. Just before he was wheeled away, he whispered to me, Do not be disturbed, Chief. I will be out of here in a few days. The attending nurse looked at me with pity. But the patient did come through safely. After it was all over, his physician said, Nothing but his own desire to live saved him. He never would have pulled through if he had not refused to accept the possibility of death. Editor's Comments by the 1980s, the phenomenon that Napoleon Hill wrote about in the preceding paragraph was embraced by a growing segment of the population. Among the adherents were numerous medical professionals who incorporated the concept under the term the body-mind connection. And by the turn of the 21st century, the belief that the mind can manifest physical changes in the body had become a part of mainstream medical practice. In Chapter 5, Autosuggestion, you will find further comment on the medical aspects of having a burning desire. This is the end of the editor's comment. I believe in the power of desire backed by faith in yourself, because I have seen this power lift people from lowly beginnings to places of power and wealth. I have seen it rob the grave of its victims. I have seen it serve as the medium by which people staged a comeback after having been defeated in a hundred different ways. And I have seen it provide my own son with a normal, happy, successful life, despite nature's having sent him into the world without ears. How can you harness and use the power of desire? The first part of the answer is in the technique at the beginning of this chapter. You will learn more about it in the next and subsequent chapters of this book. Through some strange and powerful principle, nature wraps up in the impulse of strong desire that something that recognizes no such word as impossible and accepts no such reality as failure. There are no limitations to the mind except those we acknowledge.